Okay, number 20. So here is a cube, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. <laughs> Why did I say that? Where M is the midpoint of the edge G, H. So M is bang in the middle. Find the size of the angle between the line M, A. So M connecting to A. And the plane A, B, C, D. So the ground. Okay, with these kind of questions, they're always the same. Now the good thing about this problem is that we're dealing with a cube. So every length is the same. And because they don't give us a length, well, we can just make one up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and just pick a length of, I don't know, two. So this is gonna be a two by two cube. So two is all the way around. Now let's go ahead and draw the line they want. So they want the line from M all the way to A, and they want an angle between that and the plane. Now this is the bit where people get tripped up. To find the correct angle, all you have to do is basically draw a vertical line downwards so again, this will be mid midway through this line BC and then connect it across like that. Now you can kind of see that this is this line is trailing across the ground and this line here is also perpendicular because this is vertically upwards and this is on the ground. Now all you want to do here is literally work out the length of, I don't know, one line. Let's say uh, this diagonal D. Now to do it, this is just a case of 3D Pythagoras. We need to find the length around A to B b to this midpoint here and then this midpoint all the way up to m and we've got the lengths we know this length is two this tiny length which is half the distance must be one so using 3d pythagoras we can say that a squared plus b squared plus c squared must equal d, <coughs> d squared so it'll be two squared plus one squared plus two squared equals d squared okay and then just putting this in your calculator you're gonna get nine so nine equals d squared so therefore, square rooting that, D is going to give you 3. Now this will be the diagonal length. Now, literally taking this right angle triangle outside the purple triangle, we're going to have a triangle that looks a bit like this. So we know that the diagonal length is um, 3. We're trying to find this angle between. And we've got, um, um, what's it called, a vertical length of 2. Now all you guys want to do is, is refer back to Sokotoa and just pick the right pairing that we're going to deal with to solve this. So looking at this, we can see that opposite angle, we got the opposite, which is O. And this long diagonal length is the hypotenuse, because it's always opposite the right angle. So we're going to deal with so, because we've got an O and a H. We don't have adjacent or neither one. So therefore, we can say that remodeling it using Sokotor, we can say that we have sine of the angle equals the opposite O over hypotenuse 3. And then sine inversing this, you're going to get a simple result of 41.8 eight degrees that's it all done okay number 21 so here is a triangle x y z okay the perimeter of the triangle is k so the length around this is k 5 plus y plus x is k given that x equals y minus 1 find the value of k show you working clearly all right then so <laughs> it looks like they just waste space here so you can just replace this x here with y minus 1 yeah so now we're working with less variables now when you look at this triangle, we have three lengths and an angle. So when you, every time you have three lengths and an angle, we're going to end up using the cosine rule. It's always a choice between cosine and sine, but in this scenario, it's, it's cosine. If you had two matching angles and two matching lengths, then it has to be the sine rule. So using the cosine rule, the formula in the book tells us that we got it's going to be a squared equals b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cos a, where a is capital, and, and the angle. Now, to correctly identify what's what here, and this is important, because you've got one angle, which is capital A, so this has to be here, that means the, the, uh, the length opposite has to be little a. So the little a is going to be y minus 1, yeah? And now this means that the other two lengths, b and c, would be anything, 5 or y. So let's go ahead and substitute everything back in, yeah? So you've got little a, which is y minus 1, so it'll be y minus 1, all squared equals b squared, so let's say, 5 squared plus c squared, which could be y squared, minus 2 times b, which is 5, times c, which is y, cos the angle, which is 60. Now, what you could do, so <clears throat> what we have to do now is literally just simplify as much as we can go. You see this little bit over here? This part can easily catch you off. In your calculator, just write 2 times 5 times cos 60, and when you do that, you're just going to get exactly 5. And then put the y next to it. Now for y minus 1 squared, this is the same as um, y minus 1 times y minus 1. When you've got a squared bracket, it just means there's two of them. And now to expand this bracket, 
you just times term by term. So y times y, y times minus 1, minus 1 and y, and minus 1 and minus 1. So doing everything then, so multiplying that out, we're going to get y squared minus y minus another 1y plus 1. And it's going to equal the right-hand side, which is all of these lot. So 5 squared is 25 plus y squared minus 5y. All right, so we're almost done here. Yeah? We're almost done here. Yeah? Just to make your calculation a little easier, we've got y squared on both sides with equal signs, so we can cancel them out. Now, collecting like terms on both sides, we're going to have minus 2y plus 1 equals 25 minus 5y. And now let's move all the y's to the left and the non y and the numbers to the right. So adding 5y across, we're going to have 5y take away 2y, which is 3y. Minus, minusing 1 across, we're going to have 24. And then dividing this by 3, you're going to get a y value of 8. Now, because you know the value of y, which is 8, to get x is just 8 minus 1, which is 7. So x is 7. So two things are solved. Now, finally, to find the perimeter of the shape, so let me just tidy this up a bit. We just need to literally add up all these lengths. So it's going to be 5 plus y plus x. And we know what that is. It's going to be 5 plus uh, 8 plus 7. And therefore, that's going to give us um, a total length of, oh, oh my, I'm so slow. So 15, so give us total length of 20 centimeters. All right, number 22. So you go A, B, C, D, E, F is a regular hexagon. Okay, so it's regular, meaning all, ang all the interior angles are the same. Now, A, B, X and D, C, X are straight lines. So let's see, A, B, X, so this long line across and this long line going down uh, diagonally is, are straight lines. Now, the direction from A to B is the vector A. So this means that we have to represent this line by the little vector A. And going from B to C, so this direction is represented by little vector B. Now, before we read on more, every time we've got parallel lengths, we can put the same thing. So we know that A to B is going by the vector A. This is moving in the same direction, so it's also little a. And this, this, this vector here is also parallel to B to C, so that's going to be little b. Now, we don't make any assumptions about this line here because we don't know if it's the same length. But we can probably figure out, and I'm guessing it will be. So they want us to find a, a direct a vector from E all the way to X in terms of A and B. Okay, so that part is not too terrible. All you really need to do now is firstly figure out what is the interior angle of a regular hexagon. So you might know about heart, but if you don't know, we always use this formula. We say that the sum of the interior angles is always the number of sides minus 2 times 180. So that's the sum of the interior angles, yeah? And now we know we, this, we know that a hexagon is a six-sided shape, so it would be 6 minus 2, which is 4, times 180, and that gives us 720. Now, if all the sides add up to 720 degrees and there's six sides, if we divide um, the sub 720 by 6 to get one, one angle, we're going to get exactly 120 degrees. So this tells us that all these angles must be 120. Now the good thing is, now the reason why I'm doing this, by the way, is that I'm trying to figure out if this is an equilateral triangle. Because if it's an equilateral triangle, this would mean that this length would be the same as this vector A, which would be helpful. If they were different lengths, then it's not a regular shape. So we can't assume that it's the same length. Okay, so let's, let's figure that out. So we know that angles in a straight line adds up to 180, so this must be 60. This is also 60, and this is, of course, 60. So this is 100% an equilateral triangle. And because of that, we can now say that this vector must also be the same as that vector because they're, they're, they're both the same size. If this, if this length was twice as long, then this would be 2a, but it's not. Now, now, now to be honest, now we're actually almost done here. So what we want to do now is basically try and make an expression for this kind of other diagonal vector because we only know the root going from th this side of the diagonal but we don't know about the opposite end so we're trying to figure out what these kind of vectors could be now to work them out an easy way to do it is to really think about how to go from x to uh, to c using any possible map and to go from x to c we can go through this vector so we can go through minus a and then plus b so minus a plus b or b minus a that's how you can go so with vectors, you can take any possible route as long as you get to that position. So because that moves in the direction of B minus A, this is also B minus A, and this is also B minus A. Okay, so now we've got every single known vector. We can finally figure out how to go from E to X. Okay, so let's put a map down here. Yeah? So we can go through all of this route um, up here, 
and then up here as well now to do that let's have a look so we're going to travel from a first so we can say that e to x must equal a first plus uh, so you notice how we've got an arrow facing the opposite direction so if you go in opposite it'll be negative b minus a so we'll put minus sign and then we're going to go through another minus b minus a so minus b minus a and now we just collect like terms so opening the bracket carefully we're going to have a minus b plus a minus b plus a and then therefore we're going to have let's see a plus a plus a is 3a minus b minus b is minus 2b and that's the vector they want and finally number 23 Ooh, let's do it so the function f is defined as fx equals the square root of x squared plus k squared all over x for positive values of x where k is a positive number now part a Find the value of p for which the inverse function at the point p equals k. Alright, so what this is telling us is firstly, we need an expression for the inverse function. So let me just change the color of my pen. Now, to find an inverse function is a very, very easy way. Just replace all these letters of y, yeah? So just say, replace fx with fy. So it's going to be the square root of y squared plus k squared over y. And now we make this equal to x, all right? In this case, um, because they want us to find the value p, we're just going to replace this x now with the letter p, because that's what they want. So let's go ahead and simplify all of this, yeah? We have to make y the subject. Now, let's see, what do we do from here? So what we could do is clear the fraction, so multiply y across. You're going to have the square root of y squared plus k squared equals uh, p times y. To get rid of the square root, square both sides, so that cancels. And both of these are now squared. Now, what we could do is move all the y terms to the left and the non-y terms to the right. Because p squared is attached, we move them both across. So it'll be y squared minus p squared y squared equals, and then move k squared across. So it'll be minus k squared. Now, to what you want to do here is factorize the y squared, yeah? Because you want to isolate it. So it'll be y squared factorize. You get 1 minus p squared equals minus k squared. And now lastly, you want to divide 1 minus p squared across to get rid of it. So it'll be y squared equals minus k squared over 1 minus p squared. And yeah, almost done. And now we just square root to make y the subject. So you got y equals... Oh yeah, little tip. Flip the position of 1 minus p squared. So it'll be p squared minus 1. The reason why, then this part will be positive. k squared. It's the same result, just a nice little fancy way. And then yeah, put the square root sign. You literally found it. So y is basically the inverse. So we can replace this with f minus 1p. And we also know that this expression is now equal to k. So all right, so here's round two. And you know what? All this all three marks. Nice. Nah, that's, that's, that's too small. So to solve this one now for p, we have to clear the third. So clear, get rid of the square root sign. So square both sides. You will get k squared over p squared minus 1 equals k squared. Now... Let's have a look. So now we can swap positions. So we can times p squared minus 1 across. So we get k squared equals k squared times p squared minus 1. Divide k squared across. So you get k squared over k squared equals p squared minus 1. Oh my god. Now k squared over k squared cancels out. You just left with 1. So let me just put that as 1. And lastly, now you can plus 1 across. So you can get 2 equals p squared. And then you square root both sides, you get p equals plus minus root 2. Now, <laughs> I think we're done, but we're just going to double check. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Where k is a positive number. Okay, so, hold on. Okay, so, oh yeah, because k is a positive number, that means we're only, that means p would also in turn be a positive number. Because that because it has to be to get an actual positive value of p. But anyway, we're just going to say therefore p is root 2. Oof, this was a long question, wasn't it? Okay, now we're on the final part. So, the function g is defined as gx equals x squared for positive x values. Now, given that gf a equals k, in other words, this is the composite function where f enters g for k greater than 1, find an expression for a in terms of k. Okay, so for this question, this literally tells us that we need to put the function of f inside the g function. In other words, replace x squared with the function squared. So where's the function? So f we knew we know is all of this. 
So let's go ahead and copy this down for a second here. So fx equals the square root of x squared plus k squared over x. And now it tells us that we're going to put this inside of inside of g. So we say therefore g fx. So we're going to take it step by step here. We know g is x squared, so it'll be something squared. So it'll be all of this root x squared plus k squared over x squared. And simplifying this further, by the way, when you when you're squaring a square root, they cancel out. So you're left with x squared plus k squared, and then you square the x, you get over x squared. So that's what they want. That's g of x. Now let's answer the question. It says given that g f a equals k, so in other words, replace the x of a and make it equal to k. So we're gonna have let's write it down. So g f a equals a squared plus k squared over a squared. So remember, all the x's become a, and that's supposed to equal k. Find an expression for a in terms of k. Oh man, my, my tongue. <laughs> so just like the inverse function, you're going to do a lot of steps, yeah? So let's try and minimize it. So first things first, um, clear the fraction. So times a squared across, we're going to get a squared plus k squared equals k a squared. And now we want to make what a subject? We want to make a the subject. Okay, that's, when it says find expression for a in terms of k, all right, they go all right here, a equals. So we need to move all the a terms to the left and, and non-a terms to the right. So because this is glued together, move it to the left. So you've got a squared minus k squared. And then move plus k squared across will be minus k squared. Then from this point on, you can factorize a squared. So it'll be a squared 1 minus k equals minus k squared. And then just like the inverse one, divide 1 minus k across. So you've got a squared equals minus k squared over 1 minus k. Oh man, tongue twisters. And lastly, just like a nice little fancy trick, we can just rotate this position around. So it'd be a squared equals positive k squared over k minus 1. Again, when you do this, it, it just switches the sign at the top. I don't know if it's important, probably not. And then lastly, square root this and you're going to get uh, a equals the square root of k squared, which is k over root k minus 1. And I think that's it. Is it positive? Yep, k is positive. So, yeah, it looks good to me. I think this is the final result. And we leave it here. Oh, man.